Let's look at Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. This is the fourth and final servant song. Servant song. There are these four pericopes in Isaiah's book, chapter 42, 49, 50, and 53, that all refer to this illustrative servant, servant of the Lord. And this is the fourth servant song. It's the final servant song, and it's the longest servant song, which means if this was a symphony, this would be the crescendo. This shows this is, I've been hinting at who the servant is and what the servant does, but now this is just full blast, uh, wife or, uh, uh, high fidelity, <laughs> blasting through crescendo, Isaiah 52, 13 to 53, 12. This is what we read, Isaiah 52, 13. It begins in the previous chapter. See, my servant will act wisely. This word for servant is the word abed. Now, right off the bat, people will say, why doesn't Isaiah refer to this person as the Messiah, if indeed he is the Messiah? Well, let me be careful about that. That word Messiah in Hebrew, Mashiach, is not always used when it's uh, a prophet is referring to the Messiah in the Hebrew Bible. There are many occasions, in other words, where uh, Jewish interpreters will say that is definitely referring to King Messiah, and yet it's not using the word Mashiach anointed one. Uh, by contrast, there are times where the word Mashiach, Messiah, anointed one, is used of persons who are not King Messiah. Let me give you an example. The bloodthirsty King Cyrus, the Persian pagan Gentile Cyrus, is called in Isaiah 44 and Isaiah 45, God's Mashiach, his anointed one. To do what? To come in and wipe out the Babylonians. That's what. God anointed him for that reason. So not every example of the Messiah is called the Mashiach, and not every use of Mashiach is referring to the King Messiah. That being said, what's more important than the Hebrew word Messiah is the description. And there are many ways to go about this, but let me give you a straightforward way. This word, Ebed, servant, is used in Isaiah, this, this book, in chapter 37, to refer to David. Now, was David a lowly servant? No, David was the archetype, the prototype for King Messiah. That's why you read in Jeremiah 23 or Ezekiel 36 and 37. It's at the end of history and it says all of a sudden David is showing up. What's David doing there at the end of history? Well, David is a, a prototype of the Messiah because the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel 7, one like you will come after you and, and uh, he'll have a royal throne and uh, I'll have to discipline him at times, but eventually he'll have an eternal kingdom. And so David becomes the, the, the prototype for Messiah. And David in Isaiah 37 is called the Abed, the servant. So we can't say the term servant cannot refer to a king when David is the archetypical king. This language in Isaiah 52, 13 to 53, 12, I'll just say Isaiah 53 from now on so you don't get sick of me saying that. In Isaiah 53, this language describes an incredibly powerful king. It says that he's high and lofty, that he's lifted up. It says that he will divide the spoils with the strong. In other words, that's what they call an inclusio, bookends. It begins and it ends with a powerful king, and it ends with a powerful king. This passage, Isaiah 53, even uses language that is descriptive of Yahweh. You say, no way. He <laughs> didn't just say, this servant, the language used of him is also used of Yahweh God, the Tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H, the holy name. You're going to say this servant is uh, being described as, as Yahweh? Yes, I am going to say that. Actually, I'm not going to say it. Isaiah is going to say it. Isaiah 50, verse 10, who is among you that fears the Lord, Yahweh, that obeys the voice of his servant? Now, remember I said Hebrew poetry, parallelism, strophe A and strophe B. Who among you fears the Lord who obeys his servant? This could even be intensification. This could be parallelism. Lord and servant fears and obeys. Or this could be what they call apposition. Jesus is the king of kings. 
Lord of Lords. Messiahs of Messiahs. I can't think of any other appositional phrases. Uh, the Lord, the servant, the conqueror, the king. Either way you look at it, the servant is being connected with Yahweh in Isaiah 50, one of the servant songs. Isaiah 43, 23. You have burdened me with your sins. Well, wait. That could also be interpreted. And this is a legitimate interpretation from a Hebrew scholar. That word, you have burdened me, could also be translated, or that expression could be translated, you have made me a servant, abed. Same language. You have made me a servant with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. Verse 25, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. You're saying Yahweh God is going to be the servant who is going to wipe out the sins of humanity? That's what Isaiah is saying. He's putting this on par, God on par with being the servant of the people in the same book. I'm not citing from Jeremiah. I'm not citing from Ezekiel or Romans or 1 Corinthians, no less. I'm citing from the same author in the same book. Look at the context here. Verse 13, he, the servant, will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. That same Hebrew language is used of Isaiah's vision of being in the throne room with God. And he sees Yahweh God and it says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted. Same exact Hebrew language. Lifted up and highly exalted, lofty and exalted. One is referring to the servant. One is referring to Yahweh himself. Same is true in Isaiah 57, 15. The same language is used of both. So why isn't it referred to Messiah? Wrong question. Uh, this is going one further. This is using language not merely of a powerful king, but of Yahweh himself. Verse 14, yet, it should say yet. If I was to be God's editor and correct what he has to say, I would put a yet in there, but I'm not God. Yet there were many who were appalled at him. Wait a minute, you just described a majestic, powerful, messianic king, perhaps even God himself, but there were many who found him appalling. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form was marred beyond human likeness. He will sprinkle many nations. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So he's going to be incredibly majestic, but also incredibly marred. He's going to be deity, but he's going to be disfigured. And then he's going to sprinkle the nations. That Hebrew word, nazah, nazah. This is the word used of how the high priest in Leviticus 16 would take the blood of a goat and sprinkle it over the atonement cover in the Holy of Holies. Nazah, the blood, over the atonement cover. And this was a, a way, we'll come back to this. I, I keep alluding to future classes. We're going to come back to this, this whole symbol and, and a prefigurement of what Jesus would do in the sacrificial system. But at this point, just know this, the high priest would make atonement for the sins of the people by killing an innocent animal, spilling its blood over the atonement cover, which represented sin. And the Hebrew word is nazah. Here, this figure would nazah the atonement cover? No, he will nazah sprinkle many nations. He was pierced for our rebellion. Verse 5 of chapter 53. He was crushed for our iniquities. Years ago, don't ask me how this happened because I don't know. But I was invited to speak for a small Bible study of five to seven Muslim men. And they said, we're here. They're between the ages of 50 and 70. We're here because we want you to teach us the Bible. And I said, nuh -uh. And they said, yeah, huh, we want to hear what you think about the Bible. So I said, uh, okay, uh, I'm a Christian though. And they're like, we know, we want you to teach us the Bible. And I'm like, you guys don't believe in Christ. They're like, no way. Okay, like we are not Christians. Okay, so you want to meet at Panera? Yes. And you want me to teach you the Bible? Yes. So I read them Isaiah 53. And we got to this verse. And I said, who do you think this is describing? He will sprinkle many nations. And the oldest man there, I would peg him 65 or 70, he said, I think this is describing Allah. I said, you don't say. I said, why do you think it's describing Allah? He says, 
Because only Allah would have the ability to sprinkle all the nations on the earth. I said, I agree with you. That's right. And one of the men spoke up at that point and he pointed his finger at me and he crooked his eye and he said, I know what you're doing. I said, I'm not doing anything. I don't want to push my interpretation. I want to hear what you guys think the interpretation is. He said, why don't you just tell us what it means? Well, then I started telling what it meant and then it turned into a big uh, kerfuffle, as they say. And uh, that was the end of that. I got one more sitting with them and we got to talk a little bit more and uh, they weren't interested. But um, Isaiah 53 would sprinkle many nations. Quite interesting when you think about it. Yeah, who would be able to do that? Isaiah 49.6, the second of the servant songs, verse 6 says, you will do more, it's referring to the servant, than restore just the people of Israel. You got a way bigger mission. I will make you a light to the nations and you will bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. Sprinkle the nations means what? Bringing salvation to the nations. Yes, many nations. Kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? At this point, critics will say, the person speaking here in the, what is that, the first person plural, who has believed our message, these are the Gentile kings. After all, didn't it just say he would sprinkle the nations, kings would shut their mouths on account of him, and now it says who has believed our message. So the context would indicate, they would argue, it's the Gentile king speaking at this point. False. We, us, our, always refers to Israel or Judah in Isaiah, let alone in the Hebrew Bible. If this is referring to Gentile kings, this would be the only instance of that in the Hebrew Bible. Isaiah 53.8, we read, He was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. That is the covenant name, the very special name, unique name for God's people, the Jews. He was cut off for my people. This isn't talking about the Gentile kings. And let me make it even easier here. Verse 15, what kings had not heard, and then this verse, the very next verse, who believed our message, those are the same Hebrew words. So the kings had not heard, they hadn't heard what we're about to talk about. And then the very next verse says, who has believed our message? What? Are we to believe that the kings who've never heard the message are asking why no one is believing the message that they never heard in the first place? This isn't the Gentile kings. The Gentile kings had not heard and they were appalled, but then it switches to the nation of Israel, uh, uh, to uh, Isaiah himself uh, speaking on behalf of the nation, saying, who has believed our message? Not the Gentile kings, not even the people within Israel herself. He, referring to the suffering servant, grew up like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. Okay, tender shoot. This would harken back to same book, Isaiah chapter 11, where it's a clear messianic passage saying that the descendant of Jesse, David's father, you know, David is the prototypical king. Jesse's his dad. There's going to be a shoot that comes out of Jesse out of a dry stump. Here it's saying he grew up uh, before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. Like there's going to be a bunch of dry ground and then all of a sudden the shoot comes out of it. Some interpreters say that this refers to the silent years between Malachi and the new covenant. I don't know if that's reading too far into it. However, it is saying that he's coming out of something that is uh, uh, pretty desert-like, pretty uh, dry. Regardless, this is describing the Messiah. Isaiah chapter 11. Yet, there's another time I'd put in in addition. Yet, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. So the first part of verse 2 is that he, he is messianic. But the second part of verse 2 is that he's ugly. I really want them to do a, a show, a movie of Jesus where he's ugly. Like the rest of us, you know. That's what I want. Uh, again, uh, side point, I was doing a Bible study with those Muslim men, and afterward, one of the men was very offended by something I said. I said, what did I say? He said, in that passage, in verse 2, you said that Jesus was ugly. Please do not speak about one of my prophets that way. Esau, the prophet. 
in uh, the Islamic religion, he was offended that I would call Jesus ugly. Now, he believes that Jesus was just a prophet. I believe that he's God. <laughs> but it says there, no beauty or majesty. Now, King Saul, oh, he's got plenty of descriptors about him. He's, he's tall. He's big. He's, he's a king, man. First, first Samuel 9, he's a head taller than all the other Israelites. We got descriptors of that king. David, ruddy cheeked. He's good looking, man. I mean, uh, he's the man that men want to be like, and he's the man that women want to be with. You know what I mean? He's, the description for him, very clear. Jesus, this is the only description of Jesus. And he's either plain or ugly. No beauty, no majesty, nothing in his appearance that people would say that's a king. So he's a king, a tender shoot, Isaiah 11, but he's not a king. He's despised, rejected by men, a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised. And we did not esteem him. They couldn't even look at him. In the Hebrew Bible, this expression occurs 31 times in the Old Testament, and it always appears in connection to God. Men hide their faces. Men, that's the subject. Hide is the verb. Hide their faces from whom? From the servant. But 31 times in the Old Testament, God is always, always used in connection. Exodus chapter 3, verse 6. Moses goes up to the burning bush and he has to hide his face from it. Hide his face from what? From, from God, from Yahweh. Take off your sandals. You're standing on holy ground. Here, men have to hide their faces from... Verse 4. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet, we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds, we are healed. I did another Bible study, this time with a group of college students in a dorm. I got them to study the Bible with me, a group of skeptics, because I bribed them with pizza. And so I brought Adriatico's pizza, and I brought it over to their dorm room, and I sat down, and we went through this passage. And I, I took Isaiah 53, and I got rid of the title Isaiah, and I got rid of the verse divisions, and I just put it into a paragraph, which you're not really supposed to do because it's poetry. But I, I did it anyway. So I just wanted it to look like prose, not poetry. And I said, why don't we read this together? And so we read it. We went around the room and took turns and read Isaiah 52, 13 to 53, 12. And after we were done, I turned to the guy to my left and I said, so-and-so, who do you think this is about? <laughs> he smiled. He said, Jesus. Oh, what about you? Jesus. The third guy, who do you think is Jesus? Fourth guy, Jesus. I said, whoa. Fifth guy, fifth guy, Jesus. I said, guys, you're giving me goosebumps. This is really creeping me out that you all said that. They said, why? I said, because I think it's Jesus too. They said, well, what gives you the creeps about that? I said, well, it's just weird that you'd say that because this was written 700 years before he ever walked the face of the earth. You don't think this is about Jesus? Pierced for our transgressions? Crushed for our iniquities? By his wounds? We are... This is like something that could come straight out of the New Testament. They had no idea. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is as silent, so he did not open his mouth. Well, hold, hold on a second. Says Jason Long from his book, Biblical Nonsense, a review of the Bible for doubting Christians. How can such a statement apply to Jesus who did a lot of preaching and correcting? He did not open his mouth. These stupid Christians. How can you believe this is about Jesus when it says he didn't open his mouth? And clearly Jesus opened his mouth. This book by Jason Long was so bad that I, you know how people write the two or three letters LOL? You know, but they, they don't really mean like you, you sent them like, hey, it's funny, I didn't show up for lunch today and you write LOL. They don't really mean that they went, <laughs> like they laughed out loud. You know what I mean? They don't really mean that. Uh, I literally LOL'd at this book on several occasions. It was that bad. I couldn't resist. I might actually include some of his stuff because uh, it's so brazen. Uh, audacious, you know, these claims, he just sounds so, uh, and he's a PhD 
in pharmaceuticals. So he's a real, he's an expert. Uh, and um, anyways, I probably should include it just for the heck of it because it's kind of funny. Anyways, the context here is not that he never spoke. Obviously, we're not saying that this figure never spoke any words in his life. The context is that he was oppressed and afflicted and being led to the slaughter. You would expect in a situation like that, it would be a good time to speak up. And yet he didn't defend himself. And that's exactly what we read about Jesus. Yeah, he talked. He talked. Um, are you the king of the Jews? Su lege. You said it. You said. You said it yourself. Uh, but we're not saying he defended himself. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off. Gazar in Hebrew. Cut off means to, to sever. Cut off. Yeah. Good translation. Cut off. From what? That could be cut off from... Uh, the people, it could be you're cut off from the community, you're, you're cut off in the sense you're cutting off the fat from, from the oxen. This is, he was cut off from the land of the living. Dead. He was killed. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death. Joseph of Arimathea. Now, I think that actually has some uh, uh, strong evidential value. Not just because I believe that the New Testament is strongly historically reliable. Not just taken on faith. There's good reasons to believe that. But the idea that you would say that Joseph of Arimathea, uh, a Sanhedrist, who presumably, according to Mark 14.55, voted to put Jesus up on that cross along with the whole Sanhedrin, Joseph of Arimathea, uh, buried, you, the Christians put the story into the hands of one of their enemies and let him be the one. This would be like, it's hard to explain. It, it would be like uh, someone who survived Auschwitz saying that Adolf Eichmann paid to have the funeral services. You don't write the story that way. You just don't write it that way. And so here we have, he was with a rich man in his death, buried in a rich man's tomb. He had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Uh, one time I was teaching on the impeccability of Jesus, that he never sinned. I thought, I wonder what skeptics would say about it. I'm just curious. I don't know why I'm having fun. So I typed in, uh, uh, when did Jesus sin? Or some, something into Google. I don't know, whatever I typed in. And the list I found was really, really good. I mean, it was awesome. Like one was, uh, he, he um, uh, destroyed a tree, a fig tree. Or he sinned right there. I was like, we're off to a great start. This is going to be great. Like, how, how do you nail Jesus on any kind of sin? That He was so squeaky clean. I mean, he raised his voice. He called people some names, stuff like that. Um, on the other hand, it was true. The uh, best, best I could think of was when he uses the whip in the temple. Now, it could be that he was only whipping the animals. It could be that he's whipping the people too. Uh, some people hold that view as well. Either way, Jesus was cut to go into the temple and to start kicking some butt and kicking people out of there. I don't think he moved everyone out. I think he started kind of a riot and started moving that whip around and getting everyone out of that temple. Um, but what he did there was a righteous thing. That temple was filled with oppression of the poor, um, lying, and going to the history of this in Josephus. It was just abominable what was happening in that temple. And Jesus went in there and cleared it out. You know, if I saw a bully picking on my kid, rubbing his face in the dirt, and another kid came in and started to push that bully back and give him kind of a check, uh, I would not call that violence. I would call that bravery. This word for violence is the word Hamas. Uh, no relation to the uh, terrorist organization. Hamas is an acronym, H-A-M-A-S. Uh, this is just a Hebrew word. However, it does mean violence and is almost, quote, always in connection with sinful violence. Jesus never committed sinful violence. And if you think whipping animals and uh, taking over the temple that was being used to oppress the poor uh, is violence, I don't know what to tell you. That was not a sin. Absolutely not. So too, Jesus has been the, the paragon, the paradigm for nonviolent resistance. Martin Luther King Gandhi, not even a Christian, looked to Jesus as the, the, the exemplar of what it means to resist in a nonviolent way. I don't think that, that uh, objection cuts it. 
Verse 10, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering. This is the Hebrew word asham, asham. Again, hearkening back to Leviticus, the blood sacrifice, the atonement, where the priest would go in and sprinkle the blood, nazah the blood over the atonement cover. The priest would also have an animal called the asham, the guilt offering that he would kill to substitute for the people. Here, this isn't an animal substituting for the guilt of the people. It's a human being. It's a man. He is the asham. He is the guilt offering. And the Lord made his life a guilt offering. Could you imagine reading this? A person is going to be the guilt offering just like that animal is? Yeah, like a lamb being led to the slaughter. Verse 7. And then it says, okay, he will see his offspring. Again, critics come in and they say, Zerah. Zerah in Hebrew means seed. Some even go so far as to say sperm. He will see his offspring. He had kids. Jesus never had kids. Ergo, this is not about Jesus. You see the argument? Jesus never had a wife, never had kids. So if he will see his offspring, it can't be about Jesus. Wait a minute. Zerah does not mean literal descendants every time. It certainly does not literally mean sperm. Okay, sperma comes from the Greek. That's way later. Sperm in our context is, I'm not going to keep saying sperm, but you get the idea, right? <laughs> uh, it's not referring to that literally. For one, this expression, yira zera, see his offspring, see his seed. This is the only usage of this expression in the Old Testament. So to say, oh, it always refers to literal offspring. Always, <laughs> once, once is this expression ever used. Second, offspring does not refer to uh, uh, sperm because how do we know that? Genesis 1.11, make it 11 verses into your Bible and plants are seed-bearing plants. Or Genesis 3.15, Eve has seed. Eve is a girl. She can't have sperm. So what is this referring to? Eve has offspring and the seed of the serpent. That is non-literal as well your offspring, her offspring. Indeed, Isaiah himself in this book uses this word zera, offspring, to refer to figurative descendants. Offspring of evil. Offspring of evildoers. These are descriptive, metaphorical descriptors. When? When does the suffering servant have offspring? He tells us, after he has made his life a guilt offering, let me ask you a question. If you know Jesus Christ, are you his offspring? Yes, you are. Are you the, the literal, biological offspring of Jesus? No. We are all sons and daughters of God. We're the sons of God. Spiritual offspring. That's fully consistent with how Isaiah uses this word. Wait a minute. Guilt offering cut off from the land of the living, but he will see his offspring and prolong his days. Wait a minute. I thought he was the Asham, killed. Now he's prolonging his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of light. I thought he was dead. And he's going to be satisfied. Well, let me summarize this. The, the servant was led to the slaughter, verse 7. Cut off from the land of the living, verse 8. Buried in a grave, verse 9 made a guilt offering, verse 10, but now he is back. What does that mean? Dead as a doornail, but now he's alive, seeing the light of life, having offspring. That's what we would call a death, burial, and resurrection. Corinthians, uh, there was this I wanted to teach you of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. By his knowledge, my righteous servant, servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great. He will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and interceded for transgressors. Now, at this point, that is so clear. Jesus, who could that be about? Jesus. 
there is a rebuttal here. People say, well, that can't be about Jesus. Why? Because earlier in Isaiah, the servant is always associated with Israel. So, for example, we can read Isaiah 41.8, Israel, my servant. 42, who in all the world is as blind as my own people? My servant, my people, my servant, Israel. 43, you are my servant, Israel. 44, O oh Israel, for you, is, how dense do you have to be to think this is about Jesus? When Isaiah, how many different times, and this is just a, a small list. I could go on and on. Israel is the servant. Or is she? I've got three problems with Israel being the servant. Number one, a historical problem. The first interpretation that we have in our possession that refers to interpreting Isaiah 53 is a targum. A targum is like a commentary where they write the scriptures and then put in words to explain what it means. Not really a commentary, not really a study Bible. It's a targum. And in the Targum Jonathan, which dates to the Bar Kokhba revolt, about A.D. 130s, they render Isaiah 52.13 in this way. Behold, my servant, Messiah, shall prosper. This is a Jewish interpretation that is written after the time of Christ. So they knew Christians, the New Testament cites Isaiah 4, uh, 53 40 times. They knew Christians believed this. Christians were in Israel at this time during the Bar Kokhba revolt. They knew that, and yet they still interpret Isaiah 53 as referring to Messiah. Rabbi Moshe Alshek in the 16th century, so that would be around the time of the Reformation, he says, quote, Our rabbis with one voice accept that the prophet is speaking of Messiah. Plural rabbis, we all agree Isaiah 53 is about Messiah. In fact, people who say, uh, no, Jews have always held that this is about Israel because that's what Isaiah says so many times. We don't have a singular Jewish source that interprets Isaiah 53 as referring to Israel for a thousand years after the time of Christ. If this was so obvious that Isaiah was referring to Israel as the servant, why do we not have a single Jewish source for a millennium after the time of Jesus. Now, somebody might come back and say, well, what about Origen in AD 250? You say, who's Origen? Origen was a Christian debating with uh, Jews. Origen was fluent in Hebrew. Yeah, him and Jerome were the church fathers who knew Hebrew well. He was debating with uh, Jewish uh, rabbis. And in Origen's writings, a Christian source, he refers to how his uh, uh, sparring partners that they're uh, debating over this. He says, the rabbi said that this refers to Israel in AD 250. What I wrote here is we don't have a Jewish source. So some people say, well, yeah, but origin in that, in that part, uh, uh, contra Celsus, against Celsus, he says that the Jews did interpret this to refer to Israel. I don't think that's a fly in the ointment at all. I actually, I think that supports my case. What that means is Origen included their interpretation in his work. That interpretation was known, but it didn't stick. It didn't stick for a millennium until the time of Rashi in the 11th century. He's our first source that says that the servant of Isaiah 53 is Israel. Historical problem. Second, interpretive problems. This is the thing that really matters. History is one thing. I'm just trying to get you to think if this is so clear, why don't we have a single Jewish source for a millennium? This is why. Because there's serious interpretive problems for thinking Isaiah 53 refers to Israel. Once we reach Isaiah 49, verse 6, you know, Isaiah 42, 49, 50, 53, four servant songs. Once we reach Isaiah 49, 6, Israel goes this way and the servant goes that way. Did you see all the citations I gave you? Isaiah 41 says Israel's the servant. Isaiah 42, Israel's the servant. 43, 44, not past Isaiah 49, 6. You don't find it. Israel is not called the servant. Let, let me explain. Isaiah 49, 6. It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up whom? 
the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. It is too small a thing that you should be Israel to raise up Israel and restore Israel. My servant over here raising up Jacob and Israel over here. Or in our passage, Isaiah 53, 6, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has returned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Let me read that as Israel. Ready? Israel, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of Israel has gone to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of Israel to fall on Israel. That doesn't work. Israel and the servant are separate. 53.8 The servant was struck down for the rebellion of my people. The covenant name for Israel, my people, the special name God gives to Israel, Israel was struck down for the rebellion of Israel doesn't work. He's also called a man in verse 3. He has no violence in verse 9. And he's a righteous servant in verse 11. Have you read the book of Isaiah? Just read chapter 1. Read chapter 1. Though your sins are as scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. He goes into the deplorable things they're doing. Your hands, they're covered with blood from murder. Don't you dare come to me with the sacrifices at the temple, if you're going to go out and oppress the poor, if you're going to follow injustice, if you're going to worship idols. Israel was not righteous. Israel was violent. In fact, look at the history of Israel. Look at the history of Israel. When has Israel ever, ever, ever rolled over and showed its belly and said, okay, we give up? Never. In the Assyrian invasion, 722 BC, in the invasion from Babylon, 605 BC, uh, the Maccabees and the uh, 160s, uh, Rome, they fought Rome, they fought Rome again and in the, the Jewish war in the 60s and 70s AD, Bar Kokhba, they fought like anything. Uh, today, today, to this very day, they keep fighting. They, 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 are, they are violent. They are violent. Now, I know some of that is justified in war. Uh, what I'm saying is I would never, uh, let me say this. If you're going to say Jesus going into the temple with a whip, uh, defending the oppressed and the poor, that's violence. But Israel is guilty of no violence. Walk out of this room right now because uh, we're done. We're done discussing. Uh, no violence, far from it. I'll put it this way, not righteous. And I put myself in that category. They are not righteous. Neither, no one is righteous. Your sins have separated. They've created a separation between me, you and me. Isaiah 59, 2. Uh, Israel was sinful like all of us. But this servant is not sinful. He's righteous. Number three, a theological problem. Now, for a skeptic, you might just add this to the list of things you don't believe about the Bible. Okay, fair enough. But if you're trying to be consistent with the Bible, I got a problem. God, in his commitment to the nation of Israel, in Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26, respectively, said, if you follow my law and you're righteous, I'll bless you. But if you don't follow my law, I'll curse you. If you follow, I will bless. If you don't follow, I will curse. If you follow the law, I'll bless. If you don't follow, you'll curse. You'll be cursed. In Isaiah 53, does the servant follow the law or does he break the law? He's righteous. He commits no sin. There's no deceit in his mouth. No violence. Verse 9 and yet he's cursed for being righteous? That's a theological problem because God promises on his own authority and by his own character, I will never curse you for being righteous. I'll only curse you for being unrighteous. Now, an issue remains, why did Isaiah originally blend in 40, 42, 43, 40, all the way up until 49, 6? Why did he blend Israel and the servant together? It is a little bit confusing, isn't it? I would say this. Jesus was Jewish. He came from the nation of Israel. And he was the light. He was the exemplar. He was the, um, the, the conqueror. The, uh, the, the one Jew that was a light to the world. Where the rest of them failed. And uh, read your Old Testament. I'm, I'm not trying to be pejorative or, or mean or anything. I'm just saying, read your Old Testament. And 
the history of the nation of Israel is just failure after failure after failure. And yet we have one Jew who is a light to the nations. One Jew who is righteous. One Jew who doesn't have deceit in his mouth or violence in his hands. It would be like saying this, reading the newspaper and saying, seeing this, the United States declares war. That would be true. But you could also read the president declares war. Uh, America wins gold. Uh, Michael Phelps wins gold. Which is it? What's well, both? Michael Phelps came from America and he represents America. Jesus came from the seed of Abraham and out of the nation of Israel and he represents the nation. But he's the one who succeeded for the all. And indeed, what we're seeing here is that uh, Jesus uh, paid for the sins of the people of Israel, for Israel, within Israel. Seems to me that that makes sense. Well, common questions. Was this prediction written after the New Testament was written? No, it could not have been. We've got a scroll, when they found these scrolls in the 1950s, the Dead Sea Scrolls, in Cave 1, they found the uh, Isaiah Scroll, as it's been called, 24 feet long, containing every verse from 1-1 to 66, verse 24. The entire thing in one solid scroll. Dated through a uh, very specified form of carbon-14 testing and paleography, the science of writing, to 150 B.C. Now, you just said it was written in 700 B.C. Yeah, I believe it was. However, what's the difference? I'm saying even if you're a critic and you say, uh, it was only 150 years before Jesus was born. Only 150 years? Uh, that would be like, you know, Abraham Lincoln predicting the next president. That's what we're talking about here. Would it be any more outrageous if it was George Washington predicting the next president? It wouldn't matter at all. That's something totally outside the ability of a human person. Is this circular reasoning? Is this the Bible fulfilling the Bible? I hope you can see this. Critics, Ludemann, Airman, uh, John Dominic Crossan, agree that Jesus existed, that he was crucified, and ancient critics of Christianity, Jewish sources, Roman sources, and Greek sources, Cornelius Tacitus, Josephus, and Lucian, they all agree on this basic fact, saying Jesus was crucified, or Tacitus, he says he bore the extreme penalty, which to a Roman meant crucifixion. What if Jesus or the disciples self-fulfilled these predictions? I'm sure you're seeing a little bit of repetition at this point, aren't you? Again, I want to point out, that's a huge admission. Oh, they self-fulfilled it. Self-fulfilled what? Well, all those predictions in Isaiah 53 that sound exactly like Jesus. So they sound exactly like Jesus. Yeah, uh, no, nope, they don't sound like Jesus. That whip, man, he, he, no way, he committed violence. Uh, it's about Israel. It doesn't sound like Jesus at all. Okay, if you don't think it was about Jesus at all, you can't use this objection. If you do think it sounds exactly like Jesus, then you moved into a new arena here. Again, crucifixion was not in Jesus' self-interest. No one expected a crucified Messiah before Jesus lived. Targum Jonathan of Isaiah 52, 13. That's our first source. Uh, read, read the scholars on this. We don't have a pre-Christian source of Isaiah 53, that says that this was about the Messiah. It was only after the time of Christ that we have that. Why would you pick these, these, these uh, passages if you're trying to be king Messiah? Why not pick the ones where you're a hero, a conqueror? Jesus' closest disciples, Peter, James, and Paul, they died for their belief in this. That doesn't fit with self-fulfilling. You don't die for a lie, something that you know is a lie. They didn't get money out of this. They didn't get women out of it. They didn't get power out of it. None of that. Read 2 Corinthians sometime. Nothing. They got no money uh, or no wealth, I should say, out of this. And they couldn't have self-fulfilled the worldwide impact. That is uh, a subject to which we'll return in subsequent weeks. Conclusions. The servant had a dual nature. That's what we're seeing here. He was high and lifted up and greatly exalted but he was marred more than any man. He impacted many nations, just like Isaiah 49.6 tells us. He, but, and here's what's key, he was rejected by his own nation. What, what figure made an impact on the entire globe 
that brought all of these 2.4 billion Gentiles to believe in the Jewish God who was largely rejected by his own nation, the Jews. How do you do that? How do you come out of the nation of Israel, reach all these Gentiles, but have your own people reject you by and large? I'm not saying every Jew rejects Jesus. That's not true. What I'm saying is by and large, uh, Isaiah is saying, we looked at him. We thought he was appalling. We thought this was God's curse on him. Who has believed our message? That, that's the, the view of Isaiah and the people of Israel. How do you reach all these Gentiles on the order of billions, but be rejected by your own people? He was a sin offering, and he died and rose from the dead. So who does that sound like? As we close up on a devotional point, why doesn't everyone accept this? <laughs> this is so clear. I remember reading this for the first time. Uh, I was in the introduction to the Bible class here at our church. And the guy put this up on the PowerPoint. And I was like, what is that? What? And he was reading it. And I'm like, that is, um, how, does, how, why, how do people not believe this? Why doesn't everyone accept this? Don't you remember verse 1? Who has believed our message? Even in this chapter that has some of the clearest predictions of Jesus, Isaiah also predicts that some people wouldn't believe it. You know, I hope that's not you. I hope that you would have the courage and the intellectual um, consistency that when you see good evidence, you would act on it. Not just education, you know what I mean? But application. That when you see something that's real, something like this, that you'd be able to say, that is from God. That is not, humans did not come up with that. And if that's true, we've got something here that is pointing directly to the most influential person in human history, bar none. And it's predicting his life and death and resurrection 700 years in advance. The question is, who's going to believe it? Are you going to believe that? 